Whistler's landscape is a familiar one that we take for granted, but it's undergone profound change in recent historical times, including the development of the resort and its infrastructure, and more broad-scale development like transportation and energy infrastructure. Wildfires and forest harvesting have also left their mark. When the Pacific Great Eastern Railroad arrived in the Sea to Sky Corridor in 1914, development came along for the ride. Population growth has also driven rapid changes in Sea to Sky Corridor landscapes. When the railroad improved accessibility to Whistler, British Columbia's population was a modest 440,000. Now it's close to 4.5 million. To study the changes in our area, the Whistler Forest History Project was started in 2004 with support from the Whistler Museum and Archive Society and funding from the Community Foundation of Whistler. The Forest History Association of Whistler is a co-sponsor. The project area is located about 120 kilometers, that's 75 miles, north of Vancouver in BC's coastal mountains between Squamish and Pemberton. To get a true regional perspective, the three major watershed areas adjacent to Whistler were used to define the project area. This study area includes 13 major stream and river drainage basins. This area corresponds to the Whistler, Callahan, and Sioux landscape units used by the province of British Columbia for biodiversity planning. Locally, the project extends from the Big Orange Bridge over Culloden Creek on Highway 99, north past Whistler to Naren Falls Provincial Park. Mountain peaks and ridges define the study area on both sides of Highway 99. As the project area is watershed based, it includes a range of forest types as well as alpine areas. Just over 50% of the project area is able to support forest. The rest is water, alpine, rock and ice. Almost 60% of the project area is legally protected in provincial parks, conservancies and provincially designated wildlands. This project area includes alpine terrain and significant areas of forest. The project uses a computer-based mapping system called Geographic Information System, or GIS, to document changes in land cover and to produce maps illustrating these changes. GIS is layer-based. Our GIS includes digital map layers for wildfires, harvesting, urbanization and infrastructure, including resort development, roads, rail and hydro. Historical aerial photos are a primary source of land cover information. These photos are available starting in the mid-40s. The BC Forest Service has maintained wildfire history maps since 1919. This one illustrates the 2009 Blackcomb Ridge wildfire. Forest cover maps illustrate broad land cover classes but contain no information on the date of changes. Detailed forest cover maps contain some information on land cover change, including disturbances by 20-year periods, and in some cases, date of disturbance. Disturbances include wildfire, logging, and urbanization. Vegetation inventory maps contain detailed information on land cover and change, including the date of any disturbance. Generally, this detailed disturbance information is available back to the 50s and 60s. The construction of the railroad was the first major land cover change in the area. A 100-foot right-of-way was cleared for 124 kilometers, 77 miles, through the study area. Wildfires have always been a major source of disturbance to land cover. This animation of wildfire locations by five-year periods illustrates wildfires have occurred throughout the Sea to Sky Corridor, historically from lightning strikes, but now they're both human-caused and natural. About 17% of the forest area has been burned by wildfire. Some, such as the Alpine Meadows subdivision in Whistler, have subsequently been harvested and or urbanized. Wildfires were most active in the 1911 to 1930 period. Many of these were associated with the PGE Railway. These early wildfire areas are not obvious today, having been reclaimed by forest, but they were extensive. One 1919 wildfire burned from Brackendale south of the project area to Brandywine Falls, destroying the railroad bridges in the Chequemus Canyon. Another large 1926 fire in the Shadow Lake area north of Whistler destroyed the Thompson Sawmill. Both of these fires were human-caused. Meanwhile, west of the large Shadow Lake fire is a string of lightning-caused wildfires. Wildfires south of Brandywine Falls illustrate the tendency for areas that have burned once to reburn a second or third time, consuming fuel left from the previous burns. Several major wildfires also occurred in the Alpine neighborhood north of Whistler. The major wildfire in the Chequemus Canyon again illustrates the tendency for old burns to burn again. Several wildfires also occurred in the Function Junction area. 
Wildfire occurrence during the 1971 to 1990 period was limited. The largest fire was caused by a lightning strike south of Chequemus Lake in Garibaldi Park. The forest cover maps indicate a similar lightning strike caused wildfire occurred on the bottom north end of the Chequemus Lake in early 1900s, but this wildfire was not recorded in the provincial wildfire records. Although the Project GIS database is not yet complete for the most recent period, there were relatively few wildfires. One small fire east of Daisy Lake is included, but other wildfires like the 2009 Black Home Ridge blaze have yet to be added. With the construction of the railroad, the forest industry quickly established a significant economic presence in the Sea to Sky Corridor, supplying a way of life for many. This animation shows harvesting locations by five-year periods. Forestry industry harvesting has occurred throughout the Sea to Sky Corridor, impacting the landscape and providing an economic driver for urban change as well. Sawmilling continued until the 1960s and harvesting is still ongoing at a reduced rate. Since 1914, about 21% of the forest area has been harvested. Most areas were clear-cut, but some areas were selectively logged. Some areas were also first selectively logged and then later clear-cut, and some areas were first burnt by wildfires. Finally, a significant proportion of this harvested area has subsequently been urbanized. Historical logging records for the 20-year period prior to 1930 are very limited, and the areas harvested have since been reclaimed by forest and are not visible on the earliest aerial photos. Even so, the first logging has been attributed to a pole logger, McDonald, who operated in the Whistler area in the winter of 1917. The first sawmill of record with logging to supply the mill was the Lion Lumber Company, established at McGuire in 1919. There was also some limited logging related to early homesteading in the Cedar Sky corridor. Early harvesting was concentrated in the Shadow Lake Green River area, what is now the Whistler area, and east of what is now Daisy Lake. The Green River logging was associated with the Thompson sawmill and salvage logging after the 1926 Green River wildfire. The sawmill and its small settlement were also destroyed in that fire. Some of the Whistler logging was done to supply the Parkhurst Sawmill on Green Lake that was established in 1926. Remnants of the Parkhurst operation are still there today. Although the Great Depression and World War II negatively affected the forest products industry during the 20 years between 1931 and 1950, there was still considerable harvesting activity. There were a number of sawmills operating in what is now the Whistler area during this period, including the Lost Lake Sawmill shown in this photograph. Some of this harvesting went to the local mills, while the remainder was shipped south on the railway. Harvesting during the 30s and 40s was concentrated in what is now the Whistler area, but there was also significant harvesting in the Garibaldi siding area and throughout the corridor prior to World War II. Significant selective harvesting occurred in Whistler area before the war, while more extensive clear-cut harvesting occurred in the 40s. Some of this logging was associated with wildfires in what is now the Alpine Meadows neighborhood north of Whistler in the early 40s. The area around Lost Lake was also logged at about the same time. This 20-year period and the next 20-year period witnessed the most extensive forest industry activity in the Sea to Sky Corridor. The highway to Squamish opened in the early 60s, and the last sawmill in the Sea to Sky Corridor, the Sioux Valley Lumber, located near the outlet of Green Lake, closed in 1970. As this map illustrates, harvesting was extensive in the slopes above Whistler area during the 50s and 60s. Logging was also initiated up major secondary watersheds in the corridor, such as the Chequemus River Valley, the Callahan and Brandywine Valleys, and the Rutherford Valley. Log transportation patterns also changed, with a shift from rail transportation and some manufacturing and local sawmills in the first part of the period, to truck transportation to the House Sound log market after the early 1960s. The extensive harvesting started in the last 20-year period continued through the 70s and 80s. From booms like this one, logs were towed to various mills located on salt water. As this map illustrates, harvesting was extensive and widespread, continuing further up the major watersheds in the Sea to Sky Corridor, including significant new harvesting in the Sioux River drainage. Harvesting technology was evolving during the 90s. Helicopter logging was used extensively west of Pinecrest Black Tusk. Some of this harvesting was from younger trees that regenerated following earlier wildfires. The pace of harvesting, however, was declining significantly, and there was increasing concerns about the visual impact of earlier harvesting. This resulted in a large reduction in the size of individual harvest units or cut blocks. More than a dozen sawmills operated in the Sea to Sky Corridor, one of which was the Parkhurst Sawmill on Green Lake, which operated periodically from 1926 to 66. Many of the sawmills were located in what was to be the Whistler area. 
but some were located as far south as Garibaldi Siding and as far north as Shadow Lake. These sawmills supplied important early employment in the Sea to Sky Corridor and in many cases were associated with small settlements. The Sea to Sky Corridor has been heavily urbanized since the arrival of the railroad in 1914, especially in the Whistler area with resort development starting in the 1960s. Beginning in the early 1900s, this animation shows urban development locations by five-year periods. Along with Whistler and then Blackcomb Mountains came golf courses, subdivisions, and significant infrastructure development to support the resort community. Since 1914, about 4% of the forest area has been urbanized. A small amount of non-forest wetland and alpine area has also been urbanized. This is significantly less than the area burnt by wildfire and harvested, but more significant from a habitat and biodiversity point of view as it represents a permanent land use change from forest to urban. Early impacts include clearing for the railroad and first hydro right-of-way. The Bridge River Hydro Project was started in the mid-20s and included the clearing of a power line through the Sea to Sky Corridor. But the Great Depression and World War II put the power project on hold till 1946. Two years later, Powerhouse No. 1 on Seton Lake started delivering electricity. Forest was cleared for the Rainbow Lodge on Alta Lake in 1913. The Tapley and Barnfield Farms between Alta Lake and Green Lakes and the Lina Mink Farm on Green Lake were also established during this period. There was little new urbanization in the 30s and 40s, with homesteads and small settlements springing up at McGuire and around Alta Lake Railroad Station. There was also some urbanization in the Garibaldi area south of what is now Pinecrest Black Tusk. The mid-50s saw a clearing for the Daisy Lake Reservoir, and clearing for the Whistler Mountain Ski Resort was done in the early 1960s, triggering development of Whistler neighborhoods, including Emerald Estates, Alta Vista, and Lower Whistler Creek. Significant infrastructure projects were also changing the landscape. A second Bridge River Hydro Line, the Highway, and the Kelly Lake Hydro Line all required forest clearing. 1971 to 1990 saw rapid urbanization with the establishment of the resort municipality of Whistler. Blackcomb opened and Whistler Village was developed, including new runs on the village side of Whistler Mountain. New neighborhoods, Pinecrest, Black Tusk, Alpine Meadows sprung up and development came to Function Junction. In 1991 to 2010 was a period of urban consolidation and Olympic Paralympic venue development for the 2010 Winter Games. The Whistler you see today is the result of natural and human impacts, wildfires and regrowth, logging, infrastructure, rail, highway and hydro, resort development and urbanization have all helped shape our study area. In summary, since 1914, about 4% of the forest in the study area has been urbanized, as has a small amount of non-forest wetland and alpine areas. That's significantly less than the 17% burnt by wildfire and 21% harvested. But since it's a permanent change from forestry to urban, it's more significant from a habitat and biodiversity point of view.